Um, it's called Osgrave's Virtual Universe, and we have the ability to be able to fly around things like the Earth and the solar system and travel to to other planets. Um, so here I'm going to fly to Mars, and it's nice to be able to show the kids um, different objects in space. Um, today I'm mainly going to use this to demonstrate how, how pulsars work, but you can orient the universe in such a way that you get these beautiful mm. images, which is a little bit more engaging than, than some of what we do with the school kids when we just put graphs in front of them. So I'll switch to my main talk. And this is a talk um, that I normally give as a public lecture. So I want to keep the level of it fairly low key so you don't have to have a PhD in general relativity. Um, but the main thing we're going to be talking about are these things called pulsars. And pulsars, we think, are rotating neutron stars, and they have a very intense magnetic field, and they spin fairly rapidly. So even though a pulsar is something like 20 kilometers in diameter, some of the slowest pulsars, which are actually being studied here at, at Meerkat, rotate once every few minutes. The one on the screen is rotating maybe once every 20 seconds. But the fastest pulsar actually rotates 700 times per second. And we need cutting edge instrumentation to study such pulsars. And you can do some amazing tests of gravitational theories using such fast spinning pulsars, especially with the best telescope in the world, which is Meerkat. <laughs> So in my job, um, I'm the director of the Australia's National Gravity Research Centre, and we do a lot of outreach with, with school children. Um, this little girl is looking at a virtual solar system and you can reach out and, and touch the planets, which is very rewarding. We had to stop using headsets during the pandemic because we weren't allowed to put them on anybody's heads. But in the future, we're building a, a room at Swinburne, which will be made up of these amazing LED advertising walls. And the kids will, will come into this room, which all four sides are going to be floor to ceiling screens, and they'll learn about space and hopefully get inspired to respect science and not believe in conspiracy theories. <laughs> So the engine I'm using to power this talk is the same as what's going to drive that, that facility. And if you're ever interested here in getting the software, let me know. So we love and live on the Earth, and the Earth actually defined the meter. They decided that there should be 40 million meters from the North Pole to the South Pole and back again. And that was the French. Um, this means that the radius of the Earth is... 40,000 kilometers divided by 2 pi. You would think at a radio observatory they would have phones on silent. <laughs> but the mass of the Earth is such that there's about 6 grams per cc um, is the weight of the Earth. Uh, astronomers have been using telescopes to learn about space for many years. And Galileo was the first person to point a telescope at the heavens. And he noticed that when he looked at Jupiter, it actually had four moons. And he was the first person to discover that that moons, um, <laughs> the innermost moons travel faster than the outermost moons. And um, this was the basis for some great breakthroughs in our understanding of, of gravity. So Kepler um, used observations of the planets to work out his famous laws of motion, that the planets move in ellipses, that they sweep out equal area and equal time, and that the time it takes to go around a, a star squared is proportional to your distance from it cubed. Uh, Newton came along some time later and showed that his universal law of gravitation and the laws of motion meant that 
you could actually derive Kepler's laws if you were very good at mathematics. Einstein um, made even more breakthroughs in our understanding of gravity, and he realized that if you were in an elevator with no windows and you were experiencing gravity due to Earth, you wouldn't be able to do an experiment that could tell the difference between the gravity due to the Earth and the apparent gravity of being accelerated in outer space. And this is one of the founding postulates of the theory of general relativity. Um, but because the gravity on the Earth is so weak, it's actually very difficult to study general relativity um, using the Earth. But if you have pulsars, which, let's just go back. Um, these things have a density that's so high that one teaspoonful of a pulsar weighs more than all of the humans on the Earth put together. <laughs> so the gravity around a pulsar is something like a trillion times stronger than the gravity around the Earth. And so if you want to study gravity, which I do, uh, these are very good things to use. So Einstein also realized that if you were in an elevator and it was free falling in outer space in a gravitational field, or if you were not accelerating at all, and you were blindfolded and effectively by being in a windowless elevator, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So if you were shining a light against a mirror and the light was bouncing to and fro, uh, here it wouldn't move, but here it must fall in space. And so he realized that light must be affected by gravity. And so he concluded that light must bend around bodies. If you're a black hole, you can bend a lot. If you're going past the sun or the earth, you hardly bend at all, so we don't really perceive it. He also realized that light, when it left the surface of a gravitational body, had to lose energy. And because it, lose en it loses energy, it changes its color. And we call this a redshift. And because of this, clocks tick more slowly near a body than they do far away. And in fact, if you don't take this into account, GPS satellites don't work properly. So the clocks in the satellites actually tick faster than the, the clocks on Earth by a very tiny amount, but enough to make you crash your aeroplane if you don't take into account. You can think of this as meaning that space is compressed near bodies and that in the same way that charged particles, when they go past each other, emit light. That's, that's why fires glow. Um, when two bodies go past each other, they give off a gravitational wave, which literally stretches and squeezes time, uh, space and time. So as two bodies go past each other, a gravitational wave is emitted, and it squeezes you by this amount. And th this amount is very tiny. So if two black holes 30 times the mass of the sun um, bumped into each other, the amount of compression that the Earth would receive is about the same as the, the width of a hair to the nearest star. So it's very tiny. <laughs> so the first experiments of general relativity were done using the solar system. The planet Mercury goes around the sun every 88 days. And because the speed of gravity is the same as the speed of light, um, the elliptical orbit that, gravi that um, Mercury is experiencing, and I'll turn on its orbit, we might just fly above it. So this is the elliptical shape, it's like an egg shape, it's a circle seen edge on as an ellipse. And the point of closest approach down here actually changes every orbit by a super tiny amount. And if you wait 100 years, this angle has changed by 43 divided by 36 hundredths of a degree, which is bugger all, really. But it's um, a measurable amount. And even back in um, Einstein's day around 1920, um, this change in the angle between this point of closest approach was known. And it's 40, we call it 43 arc seconds a century. So that was a test of relativity that 
Einstein's theory passed. And another test you could do is you could wait till a total solar eclipse. You could look at where stars were. This would be the real position of the star, but because of the light bending, it would appear to be over here. And so this was another test, and I think it's about one arc second or one and a half arc seconds that the light bends if you're right at the surface of the star. And so this was another test of relativity. And when atomic clocks were invented uh, back in the 50s, you could put an atomic clock on a jumbo jet. You could fly at 10 kilometers above the Earth, and you could keep the top clock ticking for eight hours, fly back down to the Earth, and then test whether this clock um, was ticky, had ticked faster than the clock on Earth. And they did this in the 1950s, and it, it passed the test of general relativity. It did actually tick more, slow, uh, more quickly. But as far as gravitational waves go, these imperceptibly small waves that stretch in these space and time, Einstein thought this would, that would never be detected, and he even wrote a paper how they weren't even real, and the referee rejected his paper and said, no, you, you were right originally, there are gravitational waves, and Einstein was so offended that he never submitted a paper to that journal again, even though they are real. So how big is, uh, are the stars? So here is Saturn, which you're probably all familiar with, this is Mercury sitting next to it, and I whoa. Wait, it was a bit disappointing. Ah, here we go. So that is the Earth sitting next to um, Saturn there. So this is the size of the Earth compared to the Sun. And you can see it's very, very tiny. If we zoom out a little bit, you'll see it's even tinier. And you can actually fit a million Earths inside the Sun. And so if we wanted to make a, a neutron star, we would have to take something the size of the sun and compress it by over a, about a factor of, what would it be, about half a million. And then we could get it to become a neutron star. That's very difficult. However, at the center of stars, there's a massive chemical reaction going on. It's actually a nuclear reaction. And the hydrogen atoms, which are just a proton, are being fused together because the centers of stars are so heavy. Nevertheless, the sun is actually a kind of a boring star. It lives for like 10 billion years. And at the end of its life, it just produces something called a white dwarf, which is like the ashes of a star. And it can't make a neutron star. Fortunately, there's other stars much more exciting in our galaxy. Our galaxy has about 400 billion stars, and maybe 0.1% of them are something like 10 times the mass of the sun, and they don't live for very long. And seen here is Rigel. This is a star you can see in the southern uh, hemisphere with your naked eye. It's actually a blue supergiant, and unlike the sun, it's 20 times, uh, 20 times more massive than the sun. And at the center of this star, there's such a big volume in, engaged in nuclear reactions that Rigel is actually 100,000 times brighter than the sun if you put them at the same distance. And it's also burning its fuel 100,000 times faster. So even though it has 20 times as much fuel, it only lives for about 10 million years. So we can see how big Rigel is compared to our sun. And our sun is kind of pathetic. But the sun is enormous. It's about 1.4 million, million kilometers across. Um, and so you can see here how big Rigel is. Rigel isn't very dense. It's puffed up so much because there's so much energy being given off. It supports this enormous radius. So when Rigel ends its life, maybe in 5 million years or so, it's actually going to blow up and leave behind a what's called a supernova remnant and on the left here is what happens when a star like Rigel blows up uh, you get an expanding cl cloud of, of gas this is what is going to happen when our earth dies it'll leave behind this boring little white dot called a white dwarf but at the center of the crab nebula there's actually a neutron star and it's spinning 33 times a second 
and it's giving off as much energy as 100,000 stars, suns, all put together. And that's why this thing is glowing in a beautiful way, but also expanding very quickly. So we can see the relative sizes of these leftover stars. If you're really big, you leave behind a black hole. That's about, uh, what would it be, 60 kilometers in radius or 120 kilometers across. This is a neutron star, only 10 kilometers in radius. And white dwarfs, um, keeps not doing what I want it to do. There we go. Um, are actually about the same size as, as the Earth. But we're not going to talk too much about them today. So we live in a galaxy that looks a bit like this one. This is a near neighbor called Andromeda. It's about 100,000 light years across, so light would take 100,000 years to cross it. We think we're about two thirds of the way out um, from the center. And this is a mock up of where the stars that are still creating um, or still being created today live. So this is our Milky Way galaxy. It's a really hyper thin sort of pancake where the stars are born. Some of them are ejected out of the plane. And so you get what's called halo stars. Um, and there's a bulge which contains about 10% of the mass of the galaxy. And we are right in the plane of the galaxy, unfortunately. So the dust in the plane of the galaxy actually blocks a lot of the light. But luckily, radio waves travel through it pretty well, nicely. And so we can use radio telescopes like Meerkat to make images of the galactic center. And this is the beautiful image that was at the official opening that I was fortunate enough to be at. Right in the middle of that thing, there's what's called a supermassive black hole. It's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And then these things here are dead stars that, bl that blew up and left behind a remnant. And my favorite part of this galaxy is actually this bit here. Um, people online, I might move the mouse so you can see it. This little thing here, I believe, and Bill can tell me if I'm wrong, is actually a supermassive black hole and their radio jets way past our galaxy. But this image um, enables you to see not only stars that are blowing up, but also things that are literally millions and millions of light years away and supermassive black holes spewing out get jets of gas. So I use radio telescopes like this back in my homeland of Australia. This is the Parkes radio telescope. It helped discover the quasar. Quasars are supermassive black holes spinning out these jets. And it did it by waiting for the quasar to go past the moon and that to find a line on the sky where the quasar must be. Because it used to be very hard to determine the positions of radio sources. And Martin Schmidt at Caltech grabbed a big telescope and worked out the redshift. And he discovered that uh, quasars were actually so far away, they must be powered by the conversion of energy or of mass to energy from the E equals MC squared. So this is our model of a quasar here, supermassive black hole, nice disk of material. The disk of material literally orbits at nearly the speed of light. It's magnetized because it's so hot and creates this beam of radiation, which we're um, occasionally is pointing at us, but more often is squirting out into the distance. And there's a real image of, the, of a quasar 3C31, probably from the VLA, but I'm not sure. Um, Radio astronomy wasn't very good in its early days at doing high time resolution studies because they assumed that everything they were looking at didn't actually change. That there were just these big blobs of radio emission in the sky. So what was the point in taking a lot of the data? And in fact, the data recorders were literally a pen and paper. And uh, Bill will tell you stories, I'm sure, but you used to fill the ink up and you'd have all this paper going underneath a pen and you would wait for the pen to go up and down and you would use that to do your science. Um, Martin, oh sorry, Anthony Hewish was an expert on what's called scintillation. This is the twinkling of radio sources. And this is an AI enhanced image of what used to be a crappy photo and it makes it look really cool. Um, but this was um, the radio telescope that Jocelyn 
Bell and Anthony Hewish um, used in the 1960s when I was but a mere boy. And they pointed it up at the sky and they took out the averaging um, system in the telescope. So they had high time resolution for a change and they burnt a whole lot of um, paper. But when they did, they found that in certain directions on the sky, there were actually objects that were emitting radio waves in a regular, at a regular time. And this over here is the discovery of the first pulsar. So these little blip, downward blips are actually that up is down in this diagram. So these are literal pulses from a neutron star that's rotating about once every 1.3 seconds, which is faster than I can do without feeling sick. And so this is Jocelyn Bell, the supervisor who won the Nobel Prize for discovering these things. And maybe Meerkat can help contribute to another one by studying them. So pulsars were discovered in 1967. This diagram needs updating because we keep finding slower and slower ones and maybe they, some of them only rotate every 20 minutes. But the fastest one is rotating every 1.4 milliseconds, which is really hard to believe. So they have this magnetic field, a beam of radiation. And if you're lucky, this beam of radiation actually points at your radio telescope and you get a burst of radio waves that strikes Meerkat. Uh, we digitize that data, combine it coherently, square it, and then we can see pulses coming in, and that's how we do our study. So at the time that Meerkat was commissioned, there were about 3,000 pulsars known. There's now about 4,000. They're only about three times bigger than a black hole would be, and I haven't really told you what a black hole is. That's something that the gravity is so strong, not even light can escape. And most of them are known in our galaxy, but Meerkat's actually been finding a bunch of them in the small Magellanic clouds, which are these little local galaxies. We face a problem in that radio waves, as they travel through the universe, every time they come across an electron, whoa, <laughs> they don't make a mobile phone go off, but they do get interact with the electron and the radio waves get slowed down. And this is actually genuine meerkat data on the left here that I put into it, snuck into a science paper on fast radio bursts. And radio waves arrive, first of all, at high frequencies and then later at low frequencies because the more energetic photons at the high frequency kind of ignore the electrons more than the, the lower energy radio waves. And so you get what's called this dispersion sweep and instruments like PTUs are aimed at dividing the radio spectrum into lots of channels and removing the effects of this dispersion so that you can study the pulses from the pulsar without them being smeared. Go machine. Oh, I'm gonna have to click somewhere. That's it. So you can use the dispersion of pulsars to work out how far away they are. And this is a model of our galaxy's electrons and where we think all the pulsars are. So I might. So the blue, big blue dot is the galactic center. The red dots have low dispersion measure. So they're near the sun and the blue dots have high dispersion measure. And they're sort of about 25,000 light years away. The sun is at the center of all of these pulsars. There's a big cluster there. And the reason there's a cluster of pulsars around the sun is just because they're easier to find. They're brighter because of something called the inverse square law. So if you're twice as close to something, you're four times as bright. So we kind of know all the nearby pulsars, but the faint ones are more difficult to find. So in the 1970s, they discovered pulsars primarily by using chart recorders. And then Joe Taylor was a very clever um, UMass professor. And he did one of the first digital surveys for pulsars. So he digitized the data from a bunch of different frequency channels. And he found about 40 pulsars, including this one here, that was going around some mysterious object in an elliptical orbit. And I can turn on the orbit, I think. Um, and you can see it. And these two stars were going around each other every 7.75 hours. And back in 1984, my supervisor gave me this object 
to study for my honours degree, and I've been working on pulsars ever since, which is maybe I should get out more. I did briefly work on fast radio bursts. So because of the um, incredible gravity of these objects, they actually travel around each other at 300 kilometres per second, and they sweep by each other. So they're getting nearer and further away from each other. And all of those relativistic effects I was telling you about before can actually be studied in these systems so much better than they can on Earth. So instead of the elliptical orbit taking centuries to process around, in this system every year, the closest point of approach changes by 4.2 degrees, not 43 arc seconds a century. So this is an amazing gravitational wave laboratory. And what people soon realized was that um, not only should this orbit process really quickly, it should also exhibit uh, clocks ticking more slowly when the two neutron stars are near each other. So this pulsar should spin more slowly or appear to spin more slowly. And it should give off gravitational waves so much that the orbit will shrink by 3.1 millimeters in orbit. So even though it's about a million kilometers across here, the fact that the orbit shrinking means that the neutron stars get um, closer to each other um, by th about a centimeter a day. And if you wait about 10 years, you can actually detect that um, decay. And that decay is because they're giving off gravitational waves and that's taking away energy and the energy comes from the orbit. And in about 300 million years, these two stars are actually gonna rip each other apart because they'll be so close and they'll give off a burst of gravitational waves and create a new star called a kilonova, which only lasts about a week. So one of the things I haven't yet explained is that a lot of the pulsars are only rotating like once a second. This is their spin period against magnetic field. But there's a bunch of pulsars down here that are spinning about 500 times a second. And so how does that work? Well, we have a model of how we explain that. And it starts with two stars. There's a good star and a bad star. The good star is a bit like the sun. It's only about one solar mass. A bad star is like Rigel and like 20 solar masses. They're not really to scale here. But this star lives its life fast and dies young. So it burns all of its hydrogen. You can imagine the sort of bedtime conversations. You know, if you don't stop smoking, you're going to die an early death. And it's like, you don't understand the power of nicotine. I'm addicted. But anyway, this star soon burns through all of its fuel, and that causes it to swell up. And it transfers matter from this star to the good star, and it becomes bad. And so when that happens, you now have a role reversal where this star is saying, I'm, see I'm seeing what you're smoking and I'm liking it. This star here is about to blow up. When it does blow up, you end up with a neutron star. And this is not to scale, otherwise it would appear like a pixel and not be very entertaining. Now I'm gonna zoom out here so you can see what the hell's going on. Put on a trail. So this is now in what's called an elliptical orbit. And we actually know of these systems, and we study one with Meerkat called 1259-63. And it takes about three and a half years to go around the, the bad star, that's, or the good star that's now the bad star. And the neutron star spins about 50 times a second. And when it goes past the bad star, it actually encounters all of this stuff called a solar wind, and we lose sight of it for a few months, and then it comes back. So this object was discovered by Simon Johnston, who leads the Thousand Pulsar Array, which regularly observes here at Meerkat. Eventually, the good star swells up and the orbit circularizes and it transfers matter onto the neutron star. And this disk of material is rotating so quickly that it actually makes the neutron star spin faster. And it also kills the magnetic field on the neutron star. So it eventually it's going around about a thousand times a second. Then the, the um, bad star retreats um, and it either becomes something very boring called a white dwarf, in which case you get what's called a millisecond pulsar spinning like 500 times a second and a white dwarf in a super circular orbit. These typically have, an, they go around each other about once a week. Some of them are only once every six hours, some are once every few months. 
If you're lucky though, the other star is big enough to blow up and you get two pulsars going around each other. And these neutron star systems are the ideal uh, laboratories for testing gravity. And so you get one pulsar that's been recycled and is spinning really quickly. The other pulsar is initially spinning quickly, but it soon dies after a few million years and it becomes very slowly rotating and kind of boring. And they only, only ever discovered one system, which is this sort of slow pulsar. So because they give off gravitational waves, eventually the neutron stars are going around each other so quickly that an orbital period takes one millisecond. So they're going around each other a thousand times a second. They only live like that for a few seconds. They give off a burst of gravitational waves. It propagates throughout the universe. Everything in the universe literally shakes a thousand times a second and then it passes through and you end up with a black hole. And then the black hole sits there doing nothing and you can't do any experiments with it. It's kind of boring. Unless you're really, really lucky, which we'll learn about in a minute. So this was the original binary pulsar. You could work out the masses of the stars and how fast they're processing. People did all sorts of wonderful experiments on them. And in 1993, the Nobel Prize was awarded to the student who discovered it and his supervisor, Joe Taylor. And as a, a small amount of trivia, Joe marked my PhD <laughs> and was merciful. So this is the um, time at which the two neutron stars get closer to each other versus year. And in 1993, they're awarded the Nobel Prize and they stopped observing. Problem solved. And then they realized, oh, maybe it's worth observing. So this is when the two neutron stars get cl closest to each other compared to where they, where they would if the orbit wasn't shrinking. And this is a remarkable confirmation of general relativity. Am I doing for time, chair? So because of that uh, binary pulsar, people went to Congress. They got a billion dollars to build what's called the advanced LIGO detectors. These are massive vacuum tubes, four kilometers long. You fire a laser beam, like sort of James Bond style one, down the vacuum tube, it bounces off a mirror, it comes back, another one's gone in another direction. And gravitational waves have the weird property that they squeeze you in one direction and stretch you in the other. So when the radio, the white light waves meet each other back here, um, they actually cancel each other out if there's no gravitational wave, or if there is, you get light. And so people built this system and remarkably in 19, uh, 2020, uh, 2015, all right, um, they discovered gravitational waves from two black holes. And it's real because I've been there and you have to wear a funny hat so your dandruff doesn't destroy the instrument. So back in 2017, two neutron stars were seen merging. This is the um, speed or the frequency of the gravitational wave versus time. And this is actually two neutron stars um, eating each other 130 million light years away. And this is the effect on the LIGO detector. And then one and a half seconds later, there was a burst of gamma rays that lit up our Earth. And if you pointed in the right direction, there was a brand new star in the sky, which only lasted about a week, and then it faded away. So why am I here? Well, I'm here because I like studying gravity and we use something called pulsar timing. So every time that beam goes past the earth, you get a pulse. And this is a bona fide one from Meerkat. Um, this is from 1909 minus 3744, discovered at Parks by Brian Jacobi about 20 years ago. And it has this hyper narrow pulse that only takes 40 microseconds to cross the Meerkat telescope. And because of that, you can determine when this pulse hits the telescope to about 100 nanosecond accuracy every time you look at it. And 100 nanoseconds is about 30 meters of light travel time. So we've got this experimental system in, in our galaxy, and you can determine the distance to it to 30 meters every time you look at it. And it's going around a companion star about once every day and a half. And so you're measuring its distance around it and you can do all these great um, tricks with it. So 
this system um, is my favorite. It rotates every 2.95 milliseconds. It's got a white dwarf companion. And the orbit is so circular that the semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, even though they're about 500,000 kilometers long, uh, they only differ from a, a perfect circle by four microns. And we can actually measure that using Meerkat. In fact, we have measured that using Meerkat. Um, not only that, when the light travels past the white dwarf to get to Meerkat, it gets delayed because of Einstein's space-time compression. And this is his prediction of how the light should be delayed. And these are our experimental points, again with Meerkat, which is awesome. And this is the difference between the prediction and the experiment. And you can see that we can use Meerkat to test whether space-time is compressed when light goes past a massive body. Did you get your photo? Let's, there you go, wait. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, we're running out of time, so we want to get to the good stuff. So the, the Southern Hemisphere has its own neutron star system where two neutron stars go around each other. And Hu Chen Hu, who is actually sitting over at UCT today, uh, has been studying this system. It has two pulsars, one that rotates every 2.7 seconds and one that spins 100 times faster than that. And they're going around each other every 2.4 hours. So they're much more relativistic than that Nobel Prize winning system. And we've been watching this system with Meerkat for about four years. And we have witnessed exactly 3 trillion, 948 million, no, 3 billion, sorry, I lied. 3 billion, 948 million, 400,142 rotations of this pulsar. We know exactly the number of rotations it's done, and we even know the pulse arrival time to better than one part in a thousand. And so we've got these two stars. One spins super quickly, one's really boring and doesn't spin very fast at all. And you can do all sorts of amazing experiments with this, including knowing that the orbital period is 0 0.102, 251, 559, 2972 days plus or minus 29 in the last decimal place. You can also do things like work out how fast the orbital period is changing, um, how fast the periastron is advancing, that's that point of closest approach. It's almost 17 degrees a year. And the system is incredibly edge on. So when we go back and look at it, it's actually, we're very fortunate in that the orbital plane is so close to edge on that when the light travels past the slow pulsar, we can do some really cool stuff with it. So indeed, as the slow pulsar is going in front of the fast pulsar, it has this magnetic field and we're shining a light through the magnetic field of the slow pulsar. This is that space-time curvature that we saw before. Again, in the double pulsar, it works really well. This is what the profile of the pulsar looks like. It's got these two beams. And we can measure when this pulse arrives and do some really cool stuff with it. So we can measure the when did the pulse arrive. And this is the data minus our model. We've got 30,000 observations of this thing, or 30,000 arrival times, which is very nice. If we pretend that it doesn't have a companion, we can see how the orbit is changing its phase with time. This is that omega dot thing that I was telling you about, the precession of periastron. We can explore whether the time ticks more slowly at some orbital phases than others. And indeed it does. So this is the rotation period of the fast spinning pulsar changes with a delay of several hundred microseconds. And we can even work out that the orbit is decaying and the orange is Einstein's prediction and the blue dots are from Meerkat. And this is from a, um, a public portal that school kids can use to take Meerkat data and show that gravitational waves are being emitted. So this is an activity I did with some kids in the orange free state, I think it was. Um, and we, measured, we took pulsar data and proved that the Earth goes around the sun. And we were going to prove that gravitational waves are emitted by the double pulsar, but we kind of ran out of time, but next time maybe. 
You can also see that the light is bending around the neutron star. And this is a nice example of what's going on. So we have the slow spinning pulsar and it's moving past us. And the radio waves can get past the magnetosphere at certain rotation phases of the B pulsar. And then they get blocked by something going on in the magnetosphere by this disk. And so twice per orbit, and I can just reorient this nice and quickly. Here, the light would be being blocked, but then it can sneak past and you get it for a little while. And then half a turn later, it gets blocked again. And then you wait a little while and the light just gets past and then it gets blocked. And so we can explore the power of the A pulsar as a function of time. And when we do that, or when Marcus Lower does this, which is the PhD student, we can actually measure the power of the pulsar is in black versus time. And you can see that it's getting modulated by the slow pulsar. And then the colors down here represent the polarization of the light. So as the light's going through the magnetosphere, the linear polarization is getting converted to circular, which is another time for another concept. One of the more recent results when he published last month was the Trapham survey discovered a pulsar in the core of a globular cluster. And they discovered a millisecond pulsar instead of having a white dwarf companion in a circular orbit. It had a very heavy object going around it. And the problem was, normally we think that millisecond pulsars should have a very low mass companion going around in a circular orbit. But this one had either a black hole or a heavy neutron star. And so how did that occur? So we think what actually happened is that there was a collision between a pulsar and a white dwarf, which had a nice circular orbit and an evil black hole that comes in from the side here. And it causes what's called a three body encounter where the neutron stars, the neutron star, the black hole and the white dwarf go into this temporary chaotic dance. You can think of it as the black hole is a bit of an interloper that cuts into the um, otherwise beautiful pairing of the millisecond pulsar and the white dwarf. It tries to steal the white dwarf, uh, but instead they end up in this triple system, which is unstable, and they end up throwing the white dwarf out of the orbit, and you end up with a neutron star going around a very heavy star in an elliptic orbit, which is what we saw with Meerkat. I'll just finish up with um, a couple of other examples. Because there's supermassive black holes in the universe, they're actually causing the fabric of space time to stretch and squeeze. And so the millisecond pulsar timing project here at Meerkat is actually monitoring about 100 millisecond pulsars on the sky. And we are trying to tell whether space and time are being squeezed. And because black holes or in the universe can merge when galaxies merge, we expect that big galaxies are made up of little galaxies and what these call these merger trees and the black holes keep merging and you get bigger ones. That's causing the fabric of space time to stretch and shake and pulsars in the same direction should have cor correlated shakings effectively. And so we measure when the times of arrival or when the radio waves hit hits our telescope. And then we try and see if they're correlated. And if they are, pulsars that are near each other on the sky should have a correlation coefficient of zero. Pulsars that are a long way apart should have a slightly negative correlation. And then it should go back to around about 0.2. And so we've been excitingly reducing all of our Meerkat data, hoping to find evidence for gravitational waves. This is what our competitors have done. They have these kind of slightly dodgy plots, which I'm actually on this paper, so I can't be too bad. <laughs> you know, there's, if you sort of squint, you think maybe there's a sort of correlation. This is our competitors, Nanograv. They've got big error bars, but maybe it's all true. And then with Meerkat, um, we took our data and we realized that the data from Meerkat is so superior to other people. And we've got so many pulsars um, that we might be able to detect things better than they are. So this is 1909, that's that really thin pulsar that I showed you early on. 
This is the arrival time after subtracting off all of the orbital effects and the fact that the pulsars have got a parallax. So it's, an, it's got a deviation over the time we've looked at it with Meerkat of a few hundred nanoseconds. And if we correlate that and graphs like that, um, if there's a supermassive black hole um, background, it should have what's called a spectrum of minus 13 thirds, and our data does, which is kind of exciting. And so this is the no tweet part. And so this was our preliminary result, which is super, super exciting, but we think the error bars are wrong, so don't tweet this or I'm gonna have to smash your phone and we'll never be friends. But this is very exciting and we're just trying to understand do we have this right or not. But if we do, it's, it's really great. So we're super excited. So Meerkat is like an amazing facility and I'd like to thank all of you who work on it. Um, we can do some amazing experiments with our pulsars SKA should be even better, and the Meerkat is really leading the way on, on many of these experiments. So thanks once again for having me and also letting me take data, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Matthew, for a great talk. Are there any questions from the auditorium? I'm going to bring the microphone to you, or you can. Um, this one. Yes. Are, are you studying any um, neutron star black hole sort of systems, and what do you expect to learn from that, what, and what do you personally think black holes are, because, I mean, it's something that fascinates us all. <laughs> yeah, so there's a remarkable shortage of neutron star black hole systems. The best candidate is actually that one I showed you. But all we know is the mass of the neutron star plus the mass of the whatever it is, is 3.9 times the mass of the sun. And we're not sure what the breakdown is between the pulsar mass and the companion. If the pulsar is 1.4, then the other, other thing is like two and a half, and it's almost certainly a black hole. But there could actually be two 1.9 solar mass stars. So we think that the cores of globular clusters are maybe good places to hunt for them. But all our efforts to find one in the galactic plane have failed. And that's partly because the way these systems evolve, you can't get a spun up star going around a black hole. And the spun up stars live about a thousand times longer than the non spun up ones. So there's only a very short window to find a pulsar black hole. But people like Ben Stappers and Michael Kramer are trying to use Meerkat to find the first pulsar black hole, and I wish them well. Um, please tell us your pick two or three favorite things about Meerkat that makes it such a good instrument for you. And if I may sneak in a second question, what are your hit lists of one extra extra thing you want Meerkat would like Meerkat to do to make it even better for you? Okay. Um, look, Meerkat has an amazing amount of collecting area bandwidth, and it's very digital. So a lot of these radio telescopes were built in a different era when things used to be a little bit more kind of analog. And I think one of the great strengths of Meerkat is that almost everything's digital. And so the timing accuracy from Meerkat doesn't require any what we call kludges. Like often with the analog, more analog like telescopes, you've got your arrival times and all of a sudden everything's out by a microsecond and you're thinking, why is that? And somebody's plugged in a different cable or whatever. Meerkat's a beautifully digital system. The UHF band at Meerkat is like unbelievably good. That is like a paradise. The same thing in Australia is crap. It's not. It's good at the SKA site, but it's not good where Parks is, which is near a domestic town. So, you know, I, I love the UHF band. <laughs> um, I love the digital aspect of of Meerkat. All the operators and everybody are really friendly. That's really nice. Um, I actually have South African heritage, so I'm kind of, I have a soft spot for South Africa, so that's a, just a personal thing. Um, but I think the, um, the digital thing, I think, is what sets it apart from, from the others. Just everything, nobody get, nothing gets wrecked in the same, as easily as it does on a more analog facility. And if it could do one thing better, um, I think the users and the telescope developers don't interact as much as they probably should. And I think COVID is partly responsible for that. 
But I would love to be involved in like developing the software correlator and making sure that PT use talks to it. But also I'm really hoping to take a, a truckload of baseband data from every telescope back to our supercomputer and work out ways to defeat RFI by doing things like adaptive nulling, uh, subtraction of the RFI, because we've got a colossal problem facing radio astronomy, which is all the bloody satellites. And unless we can subtract off the signals, I think this radio astronomy will be compromised. So I would really like to work with the guys doing the software correlators and everything to say, oh, here's an algorithm and you can get rid of, you know, you can blank this one millisecond of data and it fixes the integration, or you can do an adaptive null on this thing, or you can subtract off the GPS signals if you use this subroutine. Um, there are a couple of questions online. Maybe we can just go to Rob Adam first of all. Um, Rob, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah, and and uh, thanks for a great talk, Matthew. Uh, this this is since you're interested in gravity, I, I'll ask the question. But I, I know that the gravity oh, regime. He's talking, but I'm not sure. Oh, is it not? I'm sorry, uh, Rob. We can't hear you. I'm just trying to sort that out. Oh gosh. Um, we can hear you, Rob, on the remote side, but I think in the auditorium they can't uh, hear. You. They're saying we can, maybe somebody can type in his question. <laughs> oh gosh, maybe I have to email you, Matthew. But but uh, look, maybe maybe uh, you know, whoever can hear me can can uh, can can, can uh, translate for Matthew. Uh, what, what I was asking Matthew was that. There's been a, a recent paper on a very different gravity regime to the one that you've been describing. In other words, strong gravity. This is this is why maybe we'll take them while we're waiting for very very weak gravitational field. Thank fields. you for for the great talk. My question is about the software that you you're using to I show think, this. Sorry, I think just because uh, the people online can hear Rob. Oh, they can't. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, so what, what I was asking is, what do you think? I mean, it's essentially what it does, this, this work, which is by Kehun Chai, I think, Korean. What it does is it basically throws into question the whole dark matter postulate. Uh, it's very odd to me that, that such very, very weak effects can, can do that. But, it's, but what it does is it basically vindicates the, the Mond theories of Beckenstein and Milgram. And I was wondering whether you'd actually had a look at that, but I, no, I know no. it's very, very different gravity to the, to the gravity that you've been studying. It's I could probably weak. turn on my sound. I can, let me try and paste this thing in. Oh, I can hear people, so. Uh, Ask a question, Rob. Okay, so sorry, I'm sorry to waste everyone's time, but uh, I what I what I wanted to ask Matthew was whether you're familiar uh, with a recent paper in a very different gravitational field uh, strength to to that which you've been studying. It's basically on wide binaries by Kehun Cha, uh, where <clears throat> what he looks at is a, is a very large number of wide binaries with low gravity, small effects on acceleration, and comes to the conclusion that the Mond theories of Bekenstein and Milgram essentially make the correct prediction, which throws out dark matter entirely. And I mean, I can, I can paste the, the reference in the chat if anyone's interested. Yes, sorry, sorry I'm, I'm not familiar with that. But um it sounds like an interesting paper okay let me let me do that then uh, yeah again it's very different from what you've been looking at but let me just put it in uh, um matthew there were two more questions online um i can ask you them um i'm not sure if we can sort out the sound here, back here. Um, the one question was from Zach Smith, wanting to know about the visualization software. 
Um, and if it's open source, and can he have a look at it? Yeah, so the visualization software is, is still under development. I think we'll have a release ready for the public maybe in like four to five months. I had promised that anybody in South Africa should be able to have access to it if they're like promoting astronomy for public outreach or whatever. And I'd be happy for Zach, you to email me and I can probably give you a beta version. At the moment, it only works on Windows and um, it has some, I wouldn't call them bugs, but they're just things that cause it to be a little bit slow. So you need to have a very high-end graphics card for it to work as smoothly as it did for me on that presentation. But if you email me mbales at swin.edu.au, I would love to uh, talk to you more about it. The other question was from Andrew Martins, and it was a follow-up to Adrian's question, which was, um, what shortcomings in Meerkat data would make her, have you identified that would make a big improvement? And I think you partly answered it in being able to work more closely with people. Yeah, yeah so I think um, it, it's amazing how good the Meerkat data is. I think something that might help prevent wasted time was if we had a faster turnaround between taking the data and analyzing it. And I think if we work together, we could come up with some sanity checks that would just verify that the timing system was working perfectly. Um, we've found that we can, after an observing session, we can verify that your clock is good to about 29 nanoseconds, which is uh, amazing. But we do that typically a, a day or two after the observations end. I think we could do that much more quickly. So that might be a way we could help each other. Um, I'm really amazed at how good Meerkat data is. I don't think people appreciate how much better it is than most data we get from other telescopes for pulsar timing. Like the calibration is almost always perfect. Um, the timing seems remarkable. It um, could possibly benefit from better calibration in what I would call the RFI affected parts of the band. And we're trying to come up with a system at Swinburne where we'll be able to subtract off the interferers to do better calibration in that part of the band. But it really is a remarkably good telescope. And I think more questions from here. I think there was, or was it Isaac and then Johan? Uh, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think my question that I wanted to ask, was somebody asked it online, but um, I have an extra question, which is with regard to the RFI, that how does like, um, you know, the um, RFI from those like strong sources like GPS, as you've mentioned, affect the work that you do. And uh, with respect to the current methodologies that we have in, in the observatory, um, how is that helping you? Like, you know, the RFI detection methods that we have and, and those flags, do you use that in, in the work that you do? And is there any improvement that we can, we can make from? Um, yeah, we, we have a pipeline that searches for RFI and tries to, to remove it. It doesn't remove it in a particularly clever way. It just deletes the frequency channels and the time samples that are present. So it's more of a flagging than an adaptive removing. I think in the future, we should be able to develop algorithms to literally subtract off the RFI if it's of certain flavors, maybe not all of it, but certainly the impulsive bursts that we occasionally see that only last like less than a millisecond, they should be able to be removed. At the moment, they get folded into an eight second integration and they kind of ruin the whole thing. So that's one where area we could improve. Um, I think that depending on the frequency band, sometimes the area we delete, I'm not sure that we keep track of the fact that it's deleted very accurately and that can lead to a systematic error in our timing. So we probably need to be a bit more careful about logging when we delete stuff as opposed to just hoping that it doesn't have a bad effect.
Yeah, so my question uh, again is uh, how we can improve the instrument and this relates to especially UHF band. Should we maybe spend some effort trying to better measure that the ionosphere doing um, corrections for further rotation? Should we be doing observations of the, uh, especially when there's a larger telescope in Dalt uh, looking for uh, atmospheric or tropospheric instabilities. I mean, are, are these things that would uh, would help your observations in UHF band specifically? Because I, I know there's a large dispersive effect of the ionosphere in, in that band. Yeah, we have a problem in that as the radio waves travel through the galaxy, um, they get badly affected before they even arrive at the ionosphere. So for the super high precision, we tend to use L-band. Um, we're looking at moving some of those pulsars to UHF if they're not in a bad part of the galaxy. But I think the ionosphere is a bit of a second order effect for me. For people that really care about rotation measure, that's probably not the case. And they might benefit from either using satellites to measure what the ionosphere is doing or, or something a bit cleverer than what we're currently doing. I'm not really a polarimetry kind of person. I kind of find things and time them, but I, I suspect there are subsets of mere time that would actually value better knowing what the ionospheric RM is would be kind of good. Kat Raman Krishnan to take data with this baseband recorder that baseband records on every dish. And I'm hoping that having those voltages, which is about a petabyte an hour, on the Swinburne supercomputer will enable us to develop techniques to to better quantify some of these things. But anybody who wants to collaborate with us on that data is, is more than welcome to get an account on our supercomputer and contribute. And that will certainly be a very open source endeavor. But my dream is to ultimately have a software preprocessor for Meerkat that gets rid of all your RFI. <laughs> but that might be a bit of a fantasy. Okay, so a final question from Kamba. Oh, hi, thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, just a curious question. So I saw you had uh, two pulsars, right, uh, pulsating in different orbits. So is there a point in time where they merge together, they become in a mutual orbit, and what happens to that point? Yeah, so and all of the pulsars we know about um, won't, or won't coalesce in our lifetime. The most relativistic one we know of that we look at with Meerkat will take 80 million years to coalesce. Well, I won't be around, I don't think. <laughs> um, but it, you would have to be incredibly lucky to discover a neutron star system that merges because it only happens about once every 10 million years per galaxy. And almost all the pulsars we know about are in our galaxy. So given that we've been doing pulsar science for about 50 years, uh, probability of finding one that will coalesce is about one in a million. So we, d we didn't get that lucky. But with LIGO, you can see them merge. And it's monitoring like 10 million galaxies all the time. Okay, thanks. Just a silly one. What happens to black holes? Do they die as well? Yeah, so black holes just sit there doing nothing. If they're really lucky, um, they're at the center of a galaxy and they can grow by accreting lots of material. And some of them can even get to a billion times the mass of the sun. And then if galaxies collide, which is a, a sort of multi-billion year process, they can eventually coalesce. And if they do, they'll cause my pulsar arrival times to get delayed by certain amounts. And hopefully I can detect them that way. But most of them don't do anything. If they were in a complete vacuum, they would actually evaporate on incredibly long time scales for reasons I can go into if you like, but I won't do it now. But the actual density of the universe is such that there isn't a single black hole that's evaporating in the universe anywhere. They're all accreting more matter than they're emitting, despite what Stephen Hawking might like. All right, um, thank you very much, Matthew. That was great, thank you. And thank you, everybody online. Apologies for what we call, we couldn't hear you, and sorry it started late. Thank you very much. <laughs>